there's no better way to get better at football than playing football. So if you want to... Taylor's going to finish it! I've always been confident in my abilities. I think, you know, I'm a guy that can go out there and I always believe in myself that I'm going to get open and, and make the play if they throw me the ball. The third. Ryan, end zone shot for Pierce. He caught it! Oh, what a... Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Colts cast. We're here to talk about everything and anything Indianapolis Colts. My name is Eric Smith, co-host of the Colts cast. Alongside me, as always, I have co-host Jamal Lawrence here. Yo, yo, yo. And we have a special and. guest with us here. Let's welcome <laughs> staff writer for The Athletic, who covers the Indianapolis Colts. Colts fans already know him, the man, the myth, the legend, James Boyd. <laughs> welcome. Yeah, appreciate you having me. I don't know how special of a guest I am, but <laughs> always uh, down to talk about the Colts. So when you guys reached out, I was like, I got to do it. Yeah, no, you're you're a special guest. You're you're a special guest to us. <laughs> All right. How are you doing today, though? I'm doing good. Obviously, excited about the draft coming up. You know, we got a week from today. We'll be talking about, I would think, a quarterback, a franchise quarterback, a young quarterback. I'm sure we'll talk more about that here, but. I'm just uh, biding my time, you know, I guess reading all the rumors like everyone else, um, even trying to keep myself sane. <laughs> but obviously, I, I look at it in twofold. It's like on one hand, it's like, man, I'll be glad when it comes because you finally get you know real answers. On the other hand, it's like you got to enjoy it because, you know, this is an exciting time for the franchise because it is a quarterback pick most likely. Right. I was I was saying last episode, this is probably one of the most exciting drafts of, of the last decade for the Indianapolis Colts. But yeah, we're we're officially one one week away from the draft, you know, one mm-hmm. week, one week. It's, it's going to be one of the longest weeks. But let's let's just get right into it. I mean, James, what do you think we're going to do with the fourth overall pick? What? Yeah. If you had to make a bet right now, all your money, what's going to happen? All my money, all five dollars I have. <laughs> <laughs> I think. The more realistic option, and I've said this before, is that they stay at four. It's not the exciting thing. It's not the sexy thing. However, uh, if anybody's been paying attention the last few days, you know, Bryce Young seems to be the presumed number one pick for the Panthers. But there's been rumblings of Houston possibly not taking a quarterback at two or trading back. But if they, you know, throw a curveball in there where they just take Will Anderson and punt on a quarterback, I think the Colts are in a really good, good position to, you know, stay at four and possibly move up to number three. And if you think that it's worth it to get you to try to number three, then do that. Or stay at four and have your pick of C.J. Stroud, um, Will Levis, or um, Anthony Richardson. And so I think if Ballard makes it out of this at number four with a guy like C.J. Stroud and didn't have to move up for him, he looks like a genius, you know. So I have to give credit where credit is due. That's a big if. I do think that we're going to see some movement either at two or three. But realistically, I expect the Colts to stay at four um, and, and feel comfortable about whoever they pick there, which, in my opinion, will come down to most likely Anthony Richardson and Will Levis. I'm going to be straight up. I don't think C.J. Stroud is dropping past two. <laughs> I, <laughs> do you really think the Houston Texans are, are going to pass up and, and start Davis Mills week one? Are we- Man, so – I agree with you. I think that C.J. Stroud is too good of a prospect to just pass up and punt on. And I've heard this even from Colts fans where it's like, oh, you can just punt on the quarterback this season. You can get Caleb Williams next year. That's not a guarantee. And even Drake May isn't a guarantee. As we saw last season, the number one pick wasn't determined until the last week. And even then, it took a crazy ending for the Colts for the Bears to get the number one pick and then trade back from there. So, I think that it would be better for them to go after a quarterback and sure up that position group because their roster is so depleted at that position. But man, I think that it's, there's a little, you know, where there's smoke, there's, you know, there's fire, there's a little fire there. I think that there is a possibility because um, they're in a position to not have to, uh, I guess, go all in this season on getting a quarterback. They're not like the Colts where they, they've been on this like cycle of just terrible, guys they have some time to figure it out and D'Amico Ryans we'll, we'll see we'll see <laughs> see and, I, and I'm glad you said that because I, I that's what I was talking a couple episodes ago I said you know D'Amico as we know defense of mine he, he wants that he he it's been clearly working on defense the entire um uh free agency 
I and I fully agree. I think, like you said, well, there's smoke, there's always fire, and they could definitely entertain it. I think the only thing that would stop that will maybe hinder their decision, in my personal opinion, is knowing that they could let a potential another grade A quarterback go to a division rival. We already know, you know, Jaguars with, with Trevor Lawrence. Do they want to screw up and let CJ come here? I don't think they do. At but at the same token. I mean, that number two spot, I don't know how many teams, the well, Cardinals said they had, what, six teams interested? Not sure if the Colts are part of that. How many more teams be interested in getting to that number two spot? I, I I definitely think it's something that could happen. I don't know the Texans are willing to let, like I said, a CJ go to a division rival. But, hey, I mean, anything is possible. We, we've seen crazier things happen. It comes down to how much they believe in CJ Stroud or maybe how much they don't believe in him. Because I said the same thing on the flip side for the Colts. It's, it's like, man, if you stay at four – you better hope and pray that whoever goes to, to the Texans, if it is a quarterback or if a team jump you to number three, like the Titans, for example, in your same you know division, if they uh, you know draft a quarterback and those guys hit like they're actual really good players and you got to face them for the next 10 years. Oh man. Like you think that it's rough now. It'll be rough when it, you know, it gets down the line when they're in their prime. And so I think that this is where you really have to lean on, Obviously, your scouting department, but for the Colts, it's how much do you trust Shane Steichen and his ability to potentially work with any of the quarterbacks that are left? Because right now, you know, you're you have your third pick of the quarterbacks right now, today. That could change. And so if that changes to where you're picking four out of four and it's Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, you have to be confident that either guy um, can work with Shane Steichen and become what you would hope to be a star. And that's a lot of pressure. I've talked about it on our own podcast at the Athletic, but I think about the Colts, and you all know it because, you know, you grew up, I'm assuming, as Colts fans. This franchise, unlike any other in the league, has been defined by great quarterbacks. Like, that's what's made this franchise great. Outside of Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning, in Indianapolis, this franchise hasn't been that relevant outside of those years. So to not only trust Shane Steichen to build that quarterback, but have just the wherewithal to carry that load and that expectation because no matter who you are, if you're a quarterback coming to Indianapolis in the first round, you're going to get compared to two of the best to ever do it. Yeah, I agree. And I do, I do really believe Shane Steichen can develop that next quarterback. That's why I am okay with any of the top four quarterbacks going to the Indianapolis Colts at four or three, wherever we go. Because I, you know, if 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 you believe in Anthony Richardson, if you believe Shane Steichen can develop Anthony Richardson. I don't see why you can't believe that for Will Levis. They're, they're, they're similar builds, um, you know, different pros and cons, but but very similar athletically, um, very big guys, things like that. So that that's what I – I'm just hoping for a quarterback come draft night. Um, <laughs> that, well, that, let me, let really me ask you this, though, me, Eric. Let me, me ask you this, though, because, I mean, we, we've kind of discussed this before, both of y'all. If you got you got AR and you got Levis right there on the board, you're going you're gonna to pick – Levis over AR, Eric. Are no. you okay? No, you're gonna take AR. I'm I'm taking the the unlimited ceiling, Anthony Richardson. All right, and what what about you, James? Yeah, this is the question that always gets me in trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think Wait. that I personally would lean towards Anthony Richardson because of the upside. Good answer. And I think if you have um sort of like that lottery ticket, you know, you want to try to cash it in and get you know the total value, the full value of what it could possibly become, but the thing that I do want to point out to Eric's point is that Will Levis, and I think it's probably just more so on Twitter. I don't think this is the entire Colts fan base. I have to remind myself of that sometimes. But there's this thing of like, oh, he's not going to be good. He's going to be Carson Wentz. It's like, no, like he has potential, just like any other young quarterback coming into the draft has potential. And I think that, you know, one of the advantages he has over Anthony Richardson is that he's been familiar with NFL style offenses in college. He's actually failed. And I think that that's a good thing, you know, in college. People look at that as a downside, but it's like he's been humbled before. Not saying that Richardson isn't humble, but he's looked at as like this physical specimen who can do no wrong right now because he hasn't right. played, you know, at that level. But I think that there's something to be said about having to bounce back, find yourself, and, um, you know, kind of find your path. And he has done that, he's proven that. Um, you know, some injuries last year. I don't think that's an excuse. I don't know if people will try to tell me that, but it's legitimate. Like he had legitimate injuries. And then I also don't, don't think you can discredit how much his teammates and coaches love that dude. 
Like he is loved down in Kentucky. They think that he is a workaholic. Um, they don't have to worry about his um, dedication to the game. Not saying that Anthony Richardson isn't dedicated, but I just think it's been more advertised maybe with um, Will Levis. And that's probably because he's just played more. You know, you got two years to build your resume or build your rep up at Kentucky versus one year at Florida. And, uh, you know, I get it with Anthony Richardson. He has a ton of, ton of upside. But everyone loves upside until you don't reach it. Mm-hmm. If you don't reach it, then what? So that's that's the that's the the million dollar question. Like if we knew, if we could see the future and say, hey, Anthony Richardson, he's gonna be Cam Newton 2.0, Lamar Jackson 2.0, or Mr. Both, as he said at the combine, Cam Jackson, which I would be like, oh my god, <laughs> right? Um, if you become that, then obviously you pick him. But I think floors matter. You know, maybe not as much as the ceiling, but the floor does matter. I think that right now. Loves his floor is probably a little bit higher just because he's had the familiar, you know, NFL offenses. Yeah, and and it's, and it's super interesting that you talk, you know, because when you're discussing um, Levis there, one thing I, I think about when we think about the hype that Anthony Richardson has coming in right now for him, I felt like when he released that, you know, that that quick little, I don't want to call it a memoir, but when he, you know, wrote that page about what to expect from him. I feel like he's hearing more whispers than maybe that we are seeing on Twitter, you know, on ESPN, et cetera. Maybe there's, there are people in his camp or maybe he's just reading different things about him that he isn't quite ready to, to excel because I feel like in a situation where we've never really seen a player come out and write a letter to coaches and GM saying, Hey, I'm a grind it out for you. 110%. It, it just makes me wonder like what, what part of himself will be doubting because Everything we ever talk about with him is just, uh, you know, oh, maybe when he was in college during that time, we could have said, hey, we, he wasn't doing what we thought. But once the combine happened, everything just started upticking, upticking, upticking. It's only been higher. So I wonder what part does he say, well, maybe I'm not who I am or maybe that's just a ploy just to just to get his name out there every more. I don't know. I think when I read that piece, it was pretty genuine. I think that a lot of it also had to do with just his background, his upbringing. Mm-hmm. He was saying, you know, I wasn't the quarterback who could you know, go to all these elite camps. You know, I was more of a traditional upbringing as far as just the regular kid in America who became like the hometown hero type of guy. So I love that part of it. I think that that's also a good thing that he's been through those types of experiences and he's probably been molded by it and maybe has more appreciation for his journey. But maybe it's in a rational level of confidence and you just need that, you know, to be great in the NFL. Like, I don't expect him to say, you know, I'm not ready or I'm not going to be this. Right. You need to say that publicly, even if you don't believe it. But I think that he really does believe that he's going to be great. And we talk about, you know, him doing little things to try to help his stock. One of the things that we noticed at the combine was he came out, everyone's wearing T-shirts. He came out in like this skin tight, red Superman type of shirt. And he looked like Superman. I was like, man, this guy is ripped. So when you see him in person, you see the, the things that he can do physically, it is very enticing. Like I can see why a lot of coaches are like, man, if we get our hands on him, we can make him a player because everything he does looks effortless. I do think that he's in that 1% of rare athletes who makes other athletes look unathletic. Like that's how gifted he is athletically. Um, and I know he took offense to the question I asked at the combine. I asked him directly you know, about being labeled as a project and having more uh, stuff to do to be NFL ready. He didn't like the question. Um, let me repeat it like four times. I thought he, I guess he thought I was going to quit asking it, but I was like, <laughs> oh, like got to ask it. I mean, I thought it was a fair question because I do think if I'm being honest and you all know this, like he's not being drafted this high, projected this high because he had a great season at Florida. It's because of the flashes you saw and the greatness you see in him, not because he had a total body of work like a Lamar Jackson, like a Cam Newton, where you're like, okay, this guy's the best player in the sport. He right. wasn't that, but he can be. He really can be. Yeah, I. So I, I, I really think I, I, I really agree with you. The lottery ticket thing, Anthony Richardson. I, I think that's why he has a slight edge to Will Levis because. It's high risk, high reward. You got this guy with elite arm strength, huge frame, explosive running ability. I mean, design QB run train. Here we come. Like, and and I'll say it. I, I think other people have said this too, but it, it's a small small majority because you talked about him being a project. I think just throw him out there day one, day one, week one. Oh well, man, I don't know if you get, start him or will let baptism by fire, but. 
I'll say this. They did bring Gardner Minshew in, and I think that he would be a great mentor, even if he started, you know, the first five or six games. I do think that you probably want to get your rookie quarterback on the field at some point in 2023. I don't know if it's the first week, though, because there's so much to learn. And considering that Richard, in Richardson's case, he was a one-year starter at Florida. Like, that's that's a big, big jump to make. And, again, he didn't have, like, the season where you're like, okay, he can handle all that stuff. Now, he might listen to this and say, you know, to hell with James. I'm ready. And, and, and for me, as, as, a, as a writer, I'm covering the team. Of course, I want to see the rookie quarterback, too, play as soon as possible. But I will say this. I think his floor is higher than people give him credit for because of what you said, Eric, when it comes to the running ability. I think him being mobile and being such a dynamic runner forces defenses to give him a more simplistic look because you can't run a bunch of different coverages and do a bunch of different schemes with quarterbacks who can run as much as quarterbacks who are stationary because you have to account for the legs. The legs basically yeah. give you an extra player on the field, like 12 on 11. And so we saw that. You know, we talked about it with Zaire Franklin last week or this past week when it's like, when they played Philly, they had Philly's number. They had him until Shane Slyken called a QB draw and Jalen Hurts went untouched until the end zone. So running makes things a lot more difficult on defenses. So I don't think that, you know, it's something where he's not going to be able to play at all as a rookie. It just comes with, you know, how dedicated he is to learning the playbook. And I do think that Gardner Minshew being there, gimmicks aside, like I get it, he's like a crowd favorite and, you know, Minshew Mania or whatever, and he's got the, the funny voice or whatever, but the guy's a pretty good quarterback, and he is familiar with Shane Steichen's offense. I think that he's the perfect guy to mentor a young guy because he's very self-aware. Like, I don't think Gardner Minshew's coming in here saying, it's my job, I'm going to try to keep it forever, and, you know, this is my season. Like, he knows that he's most likely a career backup, and so if that time came where he had to sit on the bench and, and the new guy came in, I don't think he would pout about it. I think he would actually help him a lot because again, he knows the offense. Yeah, I agree. I, I just think, you know, Josh Allen, I mean, he went through it, his rookie season, got progressively better over those three years, broke out year three. I'm seeing, I'm seeing similarities there, but <laughs> maybe I not because think... Anthony Richardson does not have much experience in college. Yeah. I, so I, I can see both sides, but I did want to take that little hot take. Um, yeah, I mean, and the crazy <laughs> part is he's only 20. That is so insane to me. Yeah. Like, I I want to ask him whether he played for the Colts or not, just whenever I see him again. Like, when did you start school? Like, <laughs> did you, did you just start school early? And then, you know, usually cause I used to cover high school sports, and you can run across these kids who, like, reclassify, you know, because they're a little smaller. They want to, mm -hmm. like, go back a year so they can, like, bulk up. I'm like, this guy's – pretty much a year earlier than he's supposed to be probably in school. And he's still the most gifted athlete, physically imposing athlete out there. And so um, I'm excited for him and also the rest of the guys in this class, not only because of what the Colts could do, but because it's their dream. So I try to remember that when I'm covering this and evaluating them and giving my critiques, it's like, man, at the end of the day, to be 20 years old, you know, a week away from your dream, an opportunity to be handed the keys to a franchise, like, Man, some people have it. I think that he has that confidence. And, you know, if that confidence can catch up to or rather can his skill and, and his competency at the quarterback position catch up to the confidence, the elite, you know, traits that he has, then he can be pretty special. I mean, I'm not going to lie, like just seeing him at the combine and even like just weird little stuff like he's sitting down on his butt, you know, just throwing the ball 30 yards effortless. And it's like, that's not supposed to happen. That's not a normal human being action. So we'll see. I mean, the the thing that last thing I'll say is like the comparison in regards to the Colts is like Jalen Hurts, right? He's got the mobility, chains like improving it. But my pushback with that is Jalen Hurts is of the highest character probably of any athlete that I've ever seen, um, considering what he went through, how he's handled everything. It seems like he always says – and does the right thing, which is very hard to do when you're the quarterback at Alabama and just got benched, you know, in the national championship game. But in the same breath, he also won a ton in college, which Anthony Richardson hasn't done. So that's what makes him so unique. It's like he's got all these things, but it just – the production isn't there yet. And if it comes in the NFL, then obviously that's the best-case scenario because that's the best league in the world. 
Yeah, no, you're you're I think you're spot on with all of that. And and because I was at the combine as well. Um, and obviously I wasn't up as close in person like you were being there to interview him, but this dude was a specimen of a human. Like I remember when the first group of quarterbacks were out there throwing, when they walked, we you know when the second group walked on the field, I was looking, I was like, yo, who's this Jack dude? Because I was I don't know, I was getting a little high up in like the 200 levels, and I was like, that got it, that has to be Anthony Richardson. And then just when he started doing his warm-ups, and, and he start went to, you know, went to um do his vertical. And the crowd's just going wild while the you know first quarterbacks are throwing. I'm like, oh, that wasn't that impressive of a throw. Then I turn my head and see this guy jumping through the roof. And then you see him actually get out there and start throwing the ball and just effortlessly, like you mentioned. I mean, everything is just so smooth. And it, he, it was with the purpose. Everything was with the purpose. And he just looked like he had one goal in mind, and that was to be the best in the building. Um, and and I just think that sometimes those are traits where it's kind of hard to. It's hard to have like there was because as a 20 year old, like you mentioned, especially one who played and didn't do too hot in college for what it's worth. I'll be nervous going into that situation where you have even though Bryce isn't throwing, you still got Bryce Young there. You got CJ Stroud throwing. You got all the other first quarterbacks throwing. I mean, that's a lot of people to be around. But just to have the poise and the 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 killer instinct to be like, it means nothing to me and go out there and look good. It says a lot about his character. Yeah, I think that's what's so maybe it's because he's young. But, like, it just doesn't seem to phase him that in that particular setting, he was the guy. Like, I mean, it was a bunch of scrums for different guys every single day. He had the biggest scrum at the combine because he's so fascinating and he carries it well. And I think that that's a part of me that that's intriguing. And I would love to be like a fly on the wall for the, you know, top 30 visits or, you know, the times they get to sit down and talk to him because. It is so much so soon, but for him, it does seem like he's comfortable with that spotlight, with that target, and, and, and with that responsibility. So maybe part of that is, you know, he talked about a little bit, helping to raise his younger brother, sort of being, you know, um, an extra parent to him. Maybe that's made him mature in other ways um, off the field that's also helping him on the field. But maybe that kind of pressure, you know, real life pressure takes off the football pressure so um it's fascinating like I want to do a deep dive on his brain just because like you said it's it's a lot I mean even myself I remember thinking like man I'm gonna join the Colts beat I'm gonna cover the athletic for the athletic I'm gonna cover the Colts man this is the biggest league in America that's a lot of pressure like I thought about it myself maybe he has these moments um to himself but unlike me he doesn't share them publicly because I'm like <laughs> or I'm not gonna lie and I you know do things and I think all of us have that fear when we start something new but um he just seems like he's got something special to him besides the physical gifts. I do think that his confidence um, is pretty special. So um, yeah. I'm excited to see where he goes. If he ends up in Indy, maybe I'll uh, – people are already saying, like, what are you going to do if they draft him? You said he was a project. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Here we go. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have to fight the guy, thankfully, because I'm right. lose. <laughs> but um, it would be really cool to, to obviously cover him. But I think any of the, the top quarter, they all got stories, man, mm -hmm. if I'm in this. But if you're asking me, like, you know, who would probably be the most exciting to cover, if it's not Lamar Jackson, it's boom or bust with, you know, Anthony Richardson. Let's talk about Lamar Jackson, because I was just about to bring him up. <laughs> <laughs> Look, did, <laughs> it seems like the Colt, the, the Lamar Jackson to the Colts thing, it's it's kind of died down a little bit. But I, oh, it's dead. You, know, it's you think dead. it's dead? It's Absolutely. A hundred percent. I can never say a hundred percent, but like. Right. You know, it's it's the the it's, it's about to, it looks like it's about the flat line. I don't think it's gonna happen, man. Just because the money, um, the money is a big thing. And I do think hearing the numbers that the Ravens have offered him, like 175 million guaranteed, 200 million fully guaranteed, like two years after that with some you know roster or injury implications. If that can't get you to sign with the Ravens, like no other team is gonna give you a fully guaranteed deal. Mm -hmm. I'll let you continue your thought, Eric, and we can talk about it more. But, like, if that's, like, the hill he's willing to die on, he is not getting a fully guaranteed deal here. Like, you know, Jim Irsay made that very clear. Yep. He doesn't like it. He doesn't believe in them. And, I mean, dude, at some point, if they offer you 175, 200 million or guaranteed, like. Take it. I mean, yeah. Jalen Hurts already got paid, and he came into the league two years after you. Joe Burrow didn't get paid. Yeah. I and I, I want to see what they do with Joe Burrow too, but um, you know, I I feel like pride is the devil is taking over for Lamar Jackson because 
he just wants one million more than Deshaun Watson, that <laughs> unprecedented deal. I I just don't see it happening anymore. The owners across the league have, have basically show no interest because they don't want to fully guarantee this guy. And <laughs> this is where like Lamar Jackson not having an agent, I think really just it it deters him and and it it's it sucks because he he's like to me, he's a top five quarterback when healthy, arguably. And I, I know it's not viewed like that across the league, you know, with the execs and all that. But I don't know. Lamar Jackson, like fourth highest winning percentage, I think, among active quarterbacks is a stat. So, so let's dive into this. I like yeah, this let's... Um, because I've, I've written about it. Um, I talked to a former GM about it, did a story on it. Yes, you're completely right that him not having an agent is hurting him because agents can go places he can't. And they have experience talking to and negotiating with franchises other than the Ravens. You got to think about Lamar only has experience talking to the Ravens. He's the only one talking to them. And they're the only team that he knows like what his value is to them. He can't go to other teams and say, Hey, you know, other teams can come to him, but he can't just go out there and, and, and I guess be an agent and, and kind of float around and get, you know, some notes or some info to kind of, create a market he can't do that he hasn't done it and, and it's shown so that's number one but you talk about one percentage which is great but the flip side to that is he's been hurt the last two seasons like you better yourself last year by not you know signing a deal which was and you played phenomenal he was great until he got hurt so that that gives that knocks you down your mvp which i think is not something you can gloss over but even though you were the second youngest i mean the youngest mvp in league history you know, got it as a sophomore in the league, which is insane. That was four years ago. Like, NFL teams do not care what you've done four years ago in any position. Um, they care what you've done the last year, year and a half, two years. And, again, you've been hurt. And then the playoff success, you're one in three as a start in the playoffs. And so there's questions about can your style of play hold up durability-wise and can it lead to success in the postseason? Now, if you're asking me – who's the safest bet of like who the Colts quarterback could have been this upcoming season. It's him. Cause he's proven he's a great player in the NFL. He's proven that he can be the face of a franchise. Those things matter. However, you talk about pride is the devil. Rich people still don't want to just give up $200 million guaranteed. I don't care who it is. Like it's still a lot of money guaranteed. And to Ursay's credit, which I'm glad he just came out and said, I don't like fully guaranteed deals instead of some of these other owners who are just making up stuff. At least he just said it, but there's also the we have to give up two first round picks as well on top of the 200 million dollar deal, and that creates you know some things that makes it even more difficult. So I don't know what Lamar Jackson specifically wants. Like I don't know if he exactly wants the Deshaun Watson deal 230 fully guaranteed, but I would say just take a hard look at what Jalen Hurts got, um, and if it's comparable to that, then you should take it. I think because right now. He's just missing out on money. And the longer you wait, the more, you know, an opportunity it is for you to get hurt or something like that to happen. And you don't get any money. So, um, you know, it, I looked at something wild. Like, I want to say that him and Josh Allen came in the league at the same time. And Jamal, this dude, like, has made $32 million. This is Lamar. $32 million, is, you know, through the first four years of their career. While, you know, Josh Allen has made, like, 80-something you know, because he got the fully guaranteed money on top of what he signed for in his extension. And so I think that Lamar has to really look at that because you can go all in on this, but you will never have as much leverage to demand a fully guaranteed deal to decide where you want to go until you're a free agent. And if that's the case, you got to wait two years because uh, they can tag you this year and tag you next year. And then you become free agent. And by then, you know, you play for, you made money, but you haven't made the money that you, I think are worth. And it might not be what you think you're worth, but at some point, man, 100 M's got to be Facts. something worth <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with those things. But I, I will say two things. One, so you said give up two first-round picks. So one of those picks will be going to a quarterback, like 99% sure one of those picks because it would be our 2023 pick. Uh, most likely um, that would go to a quarterback. So really it's like one first-round pick, right? Yes, I, I agree with that because you, you're, you're basically swapping that out for a quarterback. Yes, I yeah. agree. 
Um, but again, the way Jim Ursay described those first round picks, he's like, man, these are like, he said, golden nuggets. And you know, he always says crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, good crazy stuff, at least lately. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, I think that it's still a big ass just because, again, it has to do with the money, the picks, the injury history, um, and the pride of the owners. Like you said, they don't want to make this become a thing. And I think that Lamar, even if he wants a fully guaranteed deal, which I'm never going to say players shouldn't get fully guaranteed deals. And if any league is going to have them, it should be the NFL where your, you know, your expectancy in the league isn't that long because literally any play you can get hurt. I, I firmly believe if you play like 10 years in the NFL without a major injury, like you're lucky because it can yep. happen on any single play. But like, are you the person, Lamar Jackson, are you the person that can push the needle that much? I think if, Patrick Mahomes had come out before he signed his extension and said, give me a fully guaranteed deal. He would have gotten it because it's Patrick Mahomes. And I mean, you don't say no to him ever. Yeah. And then Joe Burrow, I think is a good one. Like we don't know what his contract extension is going to look like, but if he is one of those guys who digs in his heels and says, Hey, I want a fully guaranteed deal. He's going to get it from the Bengals. And then that could set the precedent. But I think that again, that's because he's had the playoff success um, his style of play maybe more might be more sustainable down the line. Um, and he has an agent like these things matter in these circles. So um, I'm very fascinated to see where Lamar ends up. I think that he stays with the Ravens most likely yeah. mm-hmm. plays on the tag because I just don't see um, a team. I don't know, like, like the Falcons or Washington flipping the script after the draft and saying, Oh, you know what? Hey, we actually do want to trade for this guy. I mean, your picks will move to 2024 and 2025, but even then, I just don't – I think that teams are, are putting that hard line in the sand where it's like, no, we're not going to make this a thing. And people say, like, oh, they'd rather lose. Yes, they probably would. Like, you got to think, like, some of these franchises haven't won a lot <laughs> recently. And to them, it's like we'd rather keep our leverage in the long run than, like, punt it on a season or, or punt it on this quarterback who may or may not lead us to the Super Bowl. So I think that it's – you know, more to it than that. You know, I can't say how I really, really, really feel all the time, but there is definitely like, I mean, to me, the two teams that absolutely should not be saying like they're out on Lamar right now is the Falcons and, and the Washington Commanders. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, when I heard Ron Rivera say, you know, talk about Sam Howe as if he was, you know, a great player last season, I was like, wait a second, he played one game, he had one interception, one pick. And he's like, yeah, I think he had, a, he literally said this, I'm paraphrasing, but. He said something like, oh, this guy was like a Heisman candidate and he would have been a first round pick, you know, you know, had he not gone the year that he went or something like that. And I'm like, no, he was never going to be a first round pick (laughs) any year that he got drafted. No knock on him. But like I was thinking that's like, you know, people saying Sam Ellinger is going to be, you know, a league MVP. Like, no, his his ceiling is most likely a backup. I'm not saying Sam Howell can't be a starter, but. I just thought that that was a ridiculous thing to say when you have Lamar Jackson out there and a possibility to go get him. Now, if you say, hey, we did our background, we're going to go a different direction, that's one thing. But to say, to lay it on that thick for a guy that played one game and, again, had a pick and an interception, I was like, that's – I mean, even Brock Purdy did more than that. So that was that was crazy. And then, you know, you got the Atlanta owner saying, oh, he's missed time, he's missed games, all games matter in this league. You tried to pursue Deshaun Watson last year. You did not forget, <laughs> like – don't try to go back and change things now and have this revisionist history. Like, we remember that you all pursued him hard with, you know, Matt Ryan still on the roster. And if my memory serves me correct, Deshaun Watson missed the entire 2021 season because of <laughs> his alleged misconduct. I think so. 22 he missed 11 games because of his misconduct. So those games count too. And so, again, those are the two franchises where I'm looking like, really? Just say you don't want to pay someone a yeah. deal. And that to me would be more respectable than saying or trying to put up these like, I don't know, the smoke screen as to why you don't really want this guy. Because that, that to me is egregious. Like, no, you all have not been relevant, especially Washington, to be talking like this. Like that was that was nuts. Yeah. And they just got bought out, I think, right? Yeah, man, you gotta be fired up about that. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I couldn't believe this. I'm like, what? <laughs> Mark Jackson, like that dude, like yeah. he's most likely gonna make you. At least he's gonna sell tickets, yeah. number one, but like a playoff team, tickets. probably like yeah. So we'll see. I, I, I but I think that he's gotta eventually come off that hill, man. Like 
I don't think fully guaranteed deal is coming. And I don't think he has the leverage to force it. Because even the Deshaun Watson situation, like he had a no trade clause, so he could decide where he wanted to go, basically. Um, the Texans were in that position where they could not play him again because of the misconduct. So they had to trade him. And so that's another, like, you know, situation that added on. So that, that was like a, I don't want to say perfect storm because I don't want to, like, again, like discredit the allegations or the things these women may have gone through. But, you know what I mean, for the phrase itself, it was, it kind of came together where it gave him the perfect opportunity to get a fully guaranteed deal. And you got a completely desperate franchise who may regret that very soon. I mean, he did not look good last season. We will see what happens this upcoming season. But if he is bad again, my goodness, you know, Cleveland Brown fans, good mm-hmm. luck. We'll see. Mm-hmm. We'll see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I agree. I agree. Too. Yeah, my, my second thing would be like, so Lamar Jackson, he missed six games last season, I think including the playoffs mm-hmm. with that PCL strain. And I'm not a medical doctor or anything, but you, you heard rumblings that, Look, he could have played. He really could have. He just didn't want to. Yeah, and- no, man. I think PCLs are are really serious injuries, and I will never doubt a player, um, like his ability to play, or doubt that his his want to play. Like he probably could have played, but not been a better option than what they had without him. And then number two, he could have made it worse. And so, so people out there like criticizing him for not playing, Eric. I'm like. Bro, this man came back and played without an extension last season and no one better than I, and everyone loved him for it. It was like, oh, you know, hey, just go out there and play anyways. He didn't hold out, didn't do any of that stuff. And so I don't think you can, like, give him credit for that then and then throw it back in his face now and say, oh, well, you got hurt, you want to play. Like, there's no way someone can tell me Lamar Jackson. I mean, the guy who he said it, I want to win a Super Bowl, like, in his first interview in the NFL when he, like, with the hat on at the draft, I don't think that guy would ever, like, you know, discredit his team by not wanting to be out there or not, you know, going out there if he could actually be of service to them. So um, Mm. we'll see. I I think that this season is going to be very interesting. Like, I don't think the OBJ signing moves his mind as much as some might think, because at the end of the day, OBJ got his money. Like, you trying to get yours. Right. Right. Okay, Lamar Jackson to the Colts is dead. <laughs> I will put that in. <laughs> Plug it. Uh, right. back, but I mean, again, if you ask me who I want to cover, like it's that dude because I think that yeah. he, when he's healthy, I mean, he is electric like that. And but again, you got it. There's questions out there about is it sustainable? Is it successful? But um, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a Lamar just scorched earth tour. You know, I mean. Oh man, I'm with That'd it. That'd be lovely. <laughs> I think the Colts actually played Baltimore this year, so maybe uh, you all don't want to see that during that game. But <laughs> as an unbiased right. that I am, I guess I just cover whatever happened. But right, um, I remember what he did to us last time we saw him. That dude is special, man. He exactly, is. and a proven commodity, which I think again is still a safer bet than anybody in this draft class. Right, um, but we'll see. Agreed. We'll see, man. Well, what are, what are we going to do in the second round then? Let's say we take a quarterback. We got our quarterback. What should we do in the second round? I think you got some options there. I think that you obviously can go wide receiver. I think that you need some help um, in that position group just because you can't put everything on, you know, Michael Hippen Jr., Alec Pierce, and Paris Campbell was a pretty significant part of the offense last season that he was fully healthy in the slot. So I think you can go at wide receiver there. They can also go offensive line, right guard. Like if Torrance from uh, oh, Florida, from Florida, oh man, if he drops, which I don't think he does, but if he drops thirty five. <laughs> I think you should take him because I think that he shores up that spot. And you know, if your quarterback is Anthony Richardson, it might not hurt to get his teammate as well. Um, I talked to him at the Senior Bowl, and that dude is—he's for real. He's for real. So I think offensive line, wide receiver would probably be my guess in the second round. I could also see maybe cornerback. Um, but I just think that if you are drafting a quarterback, maybe you should prioritize the offensive positions in that second round and then get into like defensive and, and extra, you know, positions on top of that in the third and later rounds. But um, I'm excited for it just because 
there are some options out there. There isn't a like huge headlining wide receiver class this year, mm-hmm. but there is some talent there throughout that could be like a wide receiver two or three, you know, given time to develop. And, you know, I do want to see this too. How much does Shane Steichen's influence like Chris Ballard's thinking with who they pick? Because, you know, you all know Chris Ballard likes the bigger guys in any position. Like, give me the guy who has the traits. I'm like, hmm, do we see a variance or like a, you know, a divergence from the usual traits because they're trying to get guys that fit to Shane Steichen offense? Like, I think you can rely on him with the quarterback, obviously, right? But I wonder if you rely on him to also assist with wide receiver, tight end, offensive line, things like that, because it's going to matter who you pick at quarterback, but also what you put around him, his infrastructure. Right. And I love that you bring up Osiris Torrance because I was watching some tape on him. He <laughs> Monster. Hey, that that's the guy, I think, because <laughs> he held his own. I would say he even was just superior to Jalen Carter in that Georgia game. I mean, absolutely stood his ground against him. I mean, you see that like what what's a stronger competition than Jalen Carter? Man, you're not lying. I think that that's a great example and also uh, to my knowledge i think might be a little off but i believe he didn't even have a penalty last year at florida so like that lets you know he's disciplined like he's a guy who's not going to get you in a lot of trouble which we see in this league like penalties decide a lot in this league they decide momentum they decide if you get off the field they decide you know whether somebody gets three or seven and so um we'll see or i'll say three or six you know plus one or seven sorry no one you know accuse me of math but (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we'll see, man. I think that uh, there's a lot of exciting decisions that they have to make. Um, it starts with, obviously, the quarterback, I assume. I don't think there's going to be a trade back or a Will Anderson to Colts pipeline happening. Um, but I think that you have to seriously look at your offensive infrastructure at the, the second round if you draft a quarterback, just because I think that you you got to – I mean, you make the job easier if you can protect them, if you give another weapon. I'd be okay with that. Um I do think there are a lot of good cornerbacks in this draft. Jamal, you know, we've been looking at all these oh, yeah. cornerbacks and you got to think who, who was, who was maybe the best player out of the draft last year, the sauce Gardner. Yeah. You, know, you, get, you get somebody like that in the second round in this deep cornerback class, like, come on, that, that, that impact is different. So I, I, I love lockdown corners. Uh, that's why I was really high on Stefan Gilmore before he came to the or when he got signed to the Colts, I said he was going to be the most impactful player uh, on the Indianapolis Colts this year. And I got a lot of shit for it because they're like, oh, you, you, Matt Ryan. I was like, yeah, but you know, I've watched Stephon Gilmore play. I've watched him since Carolina. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Gamecock fan. Like that man is different. So like, well, really I don't different. know. Yeah, he's. I, I, he I got a bias, I think, with corners. You got eyes to see that he can, he can ball. I mean, they yeah. had four wins last year, and three of them were decided on his pass breakups. Exactly. Yeah. Like, he single-handedly won us the games on, on, on a lot of them. We, we we would be the number one pick without him. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was bleak, man. I, I'll ask you all this. You know, Jamal, maybe you could chime in. Like, who are some cornerbacks that have caught your eye? Because, I mean, there's probably three or four that I've looked at. You know, you got Julius Brents, you got mm, uh, big guy. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Forbes, you got uh, Ringo, mm. you got so you know, I hear I hear you groaning, and I agree, you know, he's <laughs> really uh. thin playmaker, but he's thin. But I, I, uh. I I'm just throwing it out there like these are guys who are in that range of cornerbacks outside of the first round. He's really go ahead, Eric. He he's really I I'm not like Emmanuel Forbes, he would be on my I won't say do not draft list, but he's going to be on that list where I can say I, I might pass. I, I just, you know, it's one thing to be thin at like quarterback. Like we, we keep talking about Bryce Young's frame. You know, what what what's it going to be like when a 300 pound dude lands on him? But he's not like like Emmanuel Forbes has got to be out there on every play. Like they're going to literally target him on rushing plays. They're going to put him in one on one situations. And and I don't know if he if he doesn't bulk up like. He weighed 166 pounds at the NFL Combine. I, I weigh 162. I just want to put that out there. So, <laughs> like, I there, there, there's other cornerbacks I like, you know, Keely Rango, uh, Cam Smith, Julius yeah, Brown, Cam Smith, up, yeah. Dante Bank. Like, 
and then the the like you know other cornerbacks that are probably going in the first round like i don't know i i just think chris ballard wouldn't go that way especially at that position I, I, I would be shocked if Emmanuel Forbes was an Indianapolis Colt. Um, however, I do think that, yeah, the 166 is crazy because I'm like, wow. But also, I'm like, man, he hasn't had a lot of injuries in his career just throughout his career growing up to this point. Um, obviously, that changes when you get to the NFL with bigger and stronger. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> but, I mean, and even Devontae Smith, he's super talented. He's not, you know, there are different tiers as far as prospects. But there were questions about like his durability, and sometimes like even if you're a skinny guy, it can be like some like vibranium type of vibes. But every time I see Devontae Smith get like decked, I'm like, is this gonna be the play where like he can't, he doesn't get up, and he just pops right back up. So that's one of those things where you have to really um, believe in your nutritionist and maybe like <laughs> his makeup and and if he can bulk up. But I would I would lean more towards you know like some of the guys other guys you mentioned as far as cornerbacks go. I think that Brent's is one that might really um entice them and i'll tell you all you know look out i got a story coming on him um you know a couple days just because okay. he's an indie native he grew up around here and um he's a confident dude talk to him at the senior bowl talk to him again at the local pro day talk to him at the combine um he he does not lack confidence at all and one of the quotes i remember him talking about at the senior bowl was like a lot of guys are like you know people being in their face like i'm that guy and i'm like okay like he's like I'm like, all right, man, you like you like press man. He's like, I love press man. Like, I like when it's you know, <laughs> I'm like, all right. And he's got the you know technique to work on, but he's got the long arms, the speed at his size, just kind of unique to make things very difficult. I think that's a guy you talk about traits area, like that fits more that Ballard trait. And honestly, it's not even just Ballard, it could be anybody that looks at him and says, Emmanuel Forbes, that is, and says, like, hey, he might be a little too skinny for us to take him this early. Now, I do think that he's gonna be. In my opinion, probably like a, a, a at the latest a third round pick, because you have to give credit where credit is due. I mean, the guy was a ball hawk in college, and um, actually set an FBS record with I believe six pick sixes. So um, at some point, you got to look at players and say, hey, who's making plays? And he's one of them. But um, yeah, I agree, man. That's he's such he's such a unique. I was like, man, that's crazy. Like you are one, and I know he's like eats a lot and like works out. So that's the part where I'm like, you played in the SEC, you didn't play at like some. You know, I know. Like, that's that's the fascinating part to me about him. But yeah, I agree that that I, I can see Ballard going like next. You know, maybe on on that uh you know draft prospect. Yeah. So I, I just want to ask you about Ballard because I know you're a straight shooter, dog, and 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 I can appreciate that because I've listened to plenty of things when you talk about Ballard in the past, and I, I know how Ballard is. You know, he's a, he's a defensive guy. He loves defense. Um, I'm I'm over an offensive person. I'll be the first person to tell you I'm all about guard for the second <laughs> second round without question. Um, I'll, I'll go tackle. I I've said before we could even look at bumping Ryman down to to guard and picking up a tackle and letting them learn that position. Like what what is your what's your take on Ballard and what do you think he's going to approach, especially with Shane coming in? Because I kind of feel like in the past Ballard has been the which I mean I know Jim has a lot of role when when it comes to the draft but I kind of feel like I don't know as an outsider Frank is more of a he was more of a laid back I'm gonna sit back and we can talk about it but not a lot of goes into it versus Shane I feel like he's more of a not in your face but more of an aggressive type where he wants to make sure his pieces are to the puzzle kind of as you mentioned earlier is this a time where Ballard's gonna finally say not finally but is Ballard gonna say what attributes do you want to make your offense or your defense click the way that it should I think that there is going to be some element of that because you can't not be on the same page as the guy you trusted and you picked and, and you told her, say, this is the guy. You can't then go back and say, I'm going to do things my way. Like you should, it should be a marriage of those thoughts. Um, I do think that he admitted um, at the end of the season, and this is back in, I believe, January, where he was pretty candid about how he's built the team in the past and how that hasn't worked, and how they might be a little archaic in that sense. I mean, you look at 2021, we'll take it all the way back. JT had a dominant season, one of the best in franchise history for a running back, or really player, period. First team All-Pro, first running back in Colts you know, history to have that honor since Edwin James in 1999. I was four. Um, and then you have you know, Shaq, who had an amazing season, dominant season, first team All-Pro, he looked like the maniac and it didn't matter because you didn't make the playoffs. So I think that you have to look at how you built this team and realize like 
you have talented guys, you know, left guard, Quentin Nelson, you know, linebacker, if Killender could come back and be the maniac, JT, but you have to be able to build this team starting at the quarterback position for the future and maybe more modern way of doing it. And I think that you can't always, you know, bank on, okay, I'm just going to get, you know, the usual defensive ends, a couple linebackers in the draft, and, you know, we're going to just – be, you know, one player away and figure it out. Like, no, I think that last year humbled them and humbled him to realize we have to rebuild. They haven't said it. Um, they've kind of been more of the retool mindset. But I think at some point you have to realize the team you've built isn't the team that's going to be here in the future. And so I got some backlash for this in an article that I did. Like, do you look at possibly trading Buckner, you know, after this season or things like that? Because in my mind, I think this season is going to determine a lot, not only for Ballard, but just for the future of the franchise. You want to see progress, but I think this is going to be a feeler season to see what do we do. Like, do we do we just strip this thing down after this year, after we get our quarterback and, you know, build the infrastructure that way? Or do we keep certain better pieces around to make sure that we have certain things? It's just there's a lot to decide. But I do think that Ballard has to lean on Shane Steichen and, and use his insight to help push this team into a new era that looks like the teams that are winning now and more of like the modern success, you know, stories in the league. Yeah, no, that's that's, that's very well said. Um, I wish I could articulate it just that cleanly because that's kind of what I've been thinking in my mind too, you know, as, as, as just an outsider looking in. I just look at the progression of the team that's been going on for years over the past couple of years where – I see there hasn't been any progression. It's been a regression, you know, at best. Um, and 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 I just feel like at some point, if you're Ballard, you have to, as he kind of did in January, which I'm grateful that he did, but I also felt like his back is against the wall now. He's in a, right. oh, shit, I'm in trouble. I got I to gotta say what people want to hear. Versus that mentality where you should have been saying this year three. You know what I mean? Where where we were flying okay, but we still weren't on cruise control yet. It, we were still, you know, trying to reach that that peak. So I'm excited to see what he does in this upcoming. I, I'll be the first person to tell you that I was shocked, surprised a little bit. Uh, I know Jim Irsay, or I, I, well, I know of Jim Irsay, obviously, but <laughs> I know kind of how he rolls. So I feel like he wouldn't do too much with Ballard. But I, I was not opposed. I'll, I'll keep it real. I was not opposed to Ballard, you know, being on the chopping block just because I felt like there were a lot of things that – he wasn't taking accountability for. And like I said, in January, where it's like you lose Frank, you know, or throughout the season, uh, you lose Brady throughout the season, where it's like, all right, this is starting to fall on me. So now I'm finally have to take a little responsibility for what's going on. And I, and I, I it personally, I felt like it was a day late and a dollar short. Um, but we're going to see how it turns out this, this year. Yeah, I think he did own a ton of it at the end of the season. Um, you know, I believe his first words in the presser back in January was like, I, I failed. And I'm like, yeah, like, and I think everyone kind of agreed. Um, not only him, but just the franchise itself, the entire organization did not do well last season. Um, but to your point, I think that his seat has gotten warmer. Now I'm not saying like, oh, I think that he's going to be gone. After he's, like, I think that there has to be some rubber meets the road moments where even if they don't have, like, I don't think the Colts are going to have a great season. I think all of you know, this is going to be probably a rough season because of, the biggest change is to the most important position on the field. And so I don't expect an Andrew Luck prospect to be available and to come in and just automatically push him into the playoffs. Like that's, that's rare. That is, that's special. I mean, Ryan Kelly said it the other day, he's like, that guy ain't coming through the door, like, or any other version of him in this class. And so I think that the biggest thing will be to see what can you look at and say, this is where we got better. And this is where, this is how we move forward. Like you can't come into this season and have, you know, the losses piling up, but then also have a quarterback who's not developing, you know what I'm saying? And then also have players who are in their prime and just wasting it. So I think that there is a lot of decisions that have to be made and we'll see what happens when the season gets underway. Like, I mean, honestly, even when they make the pick, we're still going to be speculating on was it the right one until we get to some games. And if we're going to look really far out, we can't know until two or three years, but Ballard might not have that. He needs to be showing Jim Irsay, like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is how we're getting better. This is why I need to still be here. And if you look at his tenure, I mean, he's seven games, I believe, under 500. Um, they haven't won a division title under him. Um, and so this is your moment. You're drafting the guy um, to pair him with the quarterback, well, not the quarterback, with, with the coach that you also chose. And, you know, you look at some of the turnover within this franchise, 
you know, with quarterbacks, coaches, staff, he's been that one constant. And so, like you said, Jamal, like some of that does have to fall on you eventually. A lot of it did this past season. And then if you want to, you know, bounce back, you got to push some of that stuff off and show people like this is what we're doing to get better. And again, it might not come up to, you know, it might not be seven wins or eight wins, but if you can, in my opinion, have four, five, six wins, but like look and see, okay, this is what we're doing to help our rookie quarterback. Most importantly, first and foremost, then people can kind of get behind that. And I know everyone's going to scream. I don't even look like looking at Facebook comments because I'm thinking that's an entirely different world over there. <laughs> like, the comments are just crazy and everything. Everybody's like, you know, you lose a game. And I'm like, does anybody not know like what this, like, what's going to happen with this team? Why this is looking the way it does? Um, you know, that's a whole other rant for a whole different day. But I do think that, you know, fans who are pretty plugged into the team like you all are and even the media will understand like, okay, this is signs of life. This is signs of growth rather than just looking straight at like the box score and saying, oh my gosh, like they're not a good team. Like they're not going to be, in my opinion, a very good team this season, but they can build a good foundation. I agree. Yeah. I think it, it, it really is going to be a feeler season. Um, I know I saw Vegas had us at about six and a half wins. So it's not, you know, super, Thanks super low expectations. <laughs> super low expectations but you know i i don't think you know i mean we saw it with brian dayball we saw it with mike mcdaniels they that they, they, they came in first year head coach did take their team to the playoffs but different environment uh different team different build everything you know i i think we're at a, we're just at a different different point uh than than they are so because we're we're still trying to figure out our quarterback situation we traded, you know, Stefan Gilmore away. Like things, things are happening that that aren't going the right way. And I, I just don't think, you know, one draft and and one head coach hire is going to fix that and launch us in the playoffs in 2023. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. But there is some talent on this team. I know people will definitely, yeah. Here. Like that's why I say you can't just have a season where you just completely bottom out and you say, oh well, we just had a rookie quarterback and didn't go well. Like no, there is enough talent on this team to get some wins. Like you shouldn't have Jonathan Taylor, Michael Pittman Jr., Alec Pierce, you know, a, a pretty solid defense, you know, minus, you know, Stephon Gilmore, a very anemic uh, uh, cornerback group right now. But you do have players on this team like Buckner and, 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 and Grover Stewart. Like these guys are very talented players. And so I think that you can't look back on the season and say, oh, you only won two games. Like that's, that to me would be pretty bad. Like you have enough players on this team to be competitive in some instances. Like for example, Houston might have one of the worst rosters in the league next season. I don't think that the Colts should probably lose both games against them. Right. I don't think they like last year they went winless. They had the tie and the loss. I don't think you should lose both games against that. Like a team like that, you know, the Titans, yeah. for example, like you probably shouldn't lose both games against them. You know, just stuff like that, in my opinion, where it's like, you know, teams that are on your level talent wise, you shouldn't be, you know, getting rolled by. And so that wasn't the case last year until I, I think about the very end when Rope kind of got let go in, in Minnesota. Then after that, it's hard to come back from. But um, yes, I was, I was that there. sickness. I was there. My oh, friend, I, was, I was gonna have a great look. Look, let me break it down for y'all. <laughs> as the sports reporter, as the writer, man. We at the game. I'm thinking, okay, they up by 30. I'm finna write this story. All I gotta do is add some quotes at the end. We finna get out of here early. We finna get something to eat. Like this is cool. Like the vibes are immaculate. <laughs> and then they start coming back, and I'm like, oh, so it, it's so funny as a writer when, and it's happened. It happens so often, even with like potential trades or signings. You write stuff, and they never see the light of day. Like my Colts, you know, win in Minnesota story. They ride this hot, you know, start to a big – that story never got published. It got scrapped never. midway through <laughs> the third, I think, or something like that. And honestly, like, that was probably one of the hardest locker rooms I've ever been in because that's when you really see, like, memes and jokes aside, how much it means to these guys. I get people who say, like, oh, the, the league is rigged. The, the, the league is rigged. No, it's not. Like, these guys really do go out there and try their hardest. But, man, like, when I got out of there, I was like – I don't know what I was thinking. I just like this day. I got so many texts from friends and family just saying like, hey, I know you were there. Like you saw history today. And I'm like, yeah, I saw some history. But that was 
That was crazy. Like, Depressing. Was, yeah. yeah. Having like the literally the easiest night, easiest day to having one of the like the most unique, bizarre days. Because even then, you know, after wins, you ask questions. You don't you don't have to think as hard about how you word them. Everyone's in a good mood. Like after a loss like that, it's like, how do you get the answers you want or the answers you're seeking without being like the person that makes you mad or makes them, you know, you know, makes them even more upset after a loss. So Wow, that was unique, man. And you know, I had a crazy rookie season. I'll say that. Like between the Jeff Saturday hiring, the the biggest oh. blowing news, the hiring and firing of coaches, um, the injuries to JT and Shaq. Like we all know what Jim was doing. I can be like good luck next season. We'll see. <laughs> right. Now, now. I'm like, they won't be healthy. Like, I want to see JT be JT. Right. I see Shaq be, you know, be Shaq. So um We'll see. The running joke here in India is like when I join a beat, they they're they're bad, and then when I leave, they get good. <laughs> so we'll nah. see. If you follow me for the last couple of years, but we'll see. I did. I will say though, after the the Ursa press conference in November, I was like, "There's no more blaming me. Like this is this is." <laughs> um, I had to I had to give underneath though that you know when that happened, but um, we'll see. You're too, man. I think that if you if you can learn anything as a fan, as a writer, as a podcaster, like. It really can, in my opinion, get any crazier than last year. Like last year really was truly an unprecedented season. I joke with Zach Kiefer, my buddy. I'm like, hey man, you might need a podcast on this. Like, not now, but like I want to <laughs> hear the the 10 year anniversary of like this season. Um, because it was whew, whew, boy, yeah. my, my, some out of a movie. What just one more thing I want to touch base on you because I know you mentioned like said the, the morale in the locker room. So I know you know at the at the um, uh, media day yesterday, you, you're talking to Ryan Kelly, and you, you kind of asked him a question about reflecting on individual play. Um, and, and and I really like that question. For one, I'm obsessed with offensive line. I used to coach O-line. I played O-line. So I love all offensive line. So, uh, you know, anytime I hear any, any talk about that, I'm, I'm super appreciative of it. You know, when, when I think of, you know, him kind of talking about how he – it's hard to be around friends and family because, of course, they want to ask him about the season. You know, he wants to break away from that, all that good jazz. How is it? And and you don't so much have to reflect on the Vikings game because I can imagine it was like next to no morale in the locker room. But how how was the progression of 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 the players throughout the season as as it went on? Because I felt like obviously week by week, you know, you, it just got worse after that Chiefs win. You know, it was like all right, well, we don't care about the first couple of losses because we got the Chiefs win, but then it started going downhill from there. So, what did you notice just kind of? from your personal aspect of being in the locker room off of individualism, you know, of how they kind of took what was going on. Yeah. I think that it really took a toll after Matt Ryan was benched that first time. Cause I think that that took something out of the team. Uh, you know, Stefan Gilmore, maybe he doesn't come to Indianapolis if Matt Ryan is in the quarterback. Um, you know, if Nick Foles said at the end of the year, like I came here because of Matt Ryan and, and people, you know, believed in him. And even though, he wasn't playing up to his standard. And I think that he really just, you know, Father Time caught up, caught up to him last year. Um, that took something out of them. And I think the losses just compounded that sense of we're not good enough. And I think that for a while there, there was that stretch where it's like, we just got to get back on track. And then there's that acceptance of we're just not good enough. And, and I even had to check myself as a writer because you want to just – tell the truth in a sense, but also like, you know, be harsh. Like, oh, they're not doing anything right. They're not. Do but then part of me was like, wait a second. Like they can try as hard as they can. They're just not good enough to, you know, be a team that can get these types of wins. And, and so after Minnesota, obviously it was very hard on them, but I think those losses, that one, even the, the last loss of the season, like how cruelly fitting it was, um, those left some some pretty big scars on the guys. And I think that, again, you see how much it weighs on them. Like, as a fan, fans think that they care more than the players. Um, and in some cases, they might, because at the Colts camp, when that guy comes and he has all the, the stuff on, and I'm like, this dude, it's 100 degrees today, and you out here looking like Every this. week. <laughs> yeah, you, you might a little different. Yeah. Than, you know, anybody I know. But in all seriousness, when you see, like, Rodney Thomas miss an interception, you go in the locker room after the game, and, you know, he's in tears, you know, because and it's a, to you, 
you're like celebrating because hey, we got a higher pick, but to them, it's like, man, we didn't we didn't come here to lose and be embarrassed. And so I think that you know, from the Matt Ryan benching to the Minnesota loss, after that, it really started to weigh on the guys and it became just a, a sort of like not that they didn't play hard, they didn't care. Like, I will never question your effort in the NFL because to go out there and put your body on the line, you have to care and be a little crazy too, because I mean, you guys be hitting, hitting. <laughs> but you know, on the flip side, uh, you know, th- there's that there's that weight of, you know, that self pride of like you put so much into your off season and even every week. Like I had to get used to switching from the NBA to the NFL. I had to learn how to cover a locker room after a loss because in the NBA there's so many, right? And so if you lose two or three in a row, it isn't the sky is falling. It isn't as hard. But if you put a week worth of time into something and you fail and it happens for a month straight, that can really weigh on a team. And so Zaire Franklin said they got to own those scars and learn from them. But um, it also taught me, you know, to really respect certain guys. Not that I don't disrespect anybody or, or not thinking anything of certain guys. It's just that certain guys to me rose in those moments when it came to high character guys like Paris Campbell, you could talk to win loss or draw. You could talk to him. Zaire Franklin the same way. Ryan Kelly, who to me is probably one of the most unfiltered players on the team. He tells it like it is. Even when he wasn't playing well, he owned it. He talked about it. You know, Quentin Nelson. And so these are guys where I'm like, okay, how do you act? And, you know, not saying that you owe me anything in the media, but um, there were certain guys I knew I could go to after a game and be like, okay, even though, like, even in Minnesota, like, as bad as it was, I knew I could go up to Grover Stewart and ask him a question and get, like, a real answer and not, you know, just be where he's, like, running off trying to duck or hide or not answer for it. Like, he answered it. And so I think that accountability be, be huge, and I do think that Shane Steichen is going to bring a level of that um, to the Colts. Not saying that Frank Reich didn't have it or Jeff Saturday, but there is an edge with Shane Steichen that the players have already talked about. And I'm excited to see that, you know, maybe more so when I'm just watching on the sideline in training camp to see what that is. But, um, yeah, that, that last season, Jamal, it, it weighed on a lot. And, man, it weighed on me, too. I was like, man, oh, I'm yeah. ready to, to, to <laughs> man, I hit the eject button. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, they're going to bounce back from it. And I do think it is exciting and to see, like, what what did you learn from that and how do you respond to that? We were <laughs> – we were dark horse Super Bowl contenders in the preseason. Man, I thought I was going to be covering the playoff game for sure. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, away, yeah, I thought it was going to be a playoff team for sure. So, yeah. it's the NFL, it's, man. Like, yeah, it, it, it's, in, this, in this this league, too, it changes quickly. Like, you can go from the top to the bottom, the bottom to the top. You know, and, and I do think that sustained excellence in this league it starts at the quarterback. And, it, and that kind of determines like your success going forward in this league. Um, it's not like the NBA where I, you know, you draft or you get three good players. You got one of the best teams in the league. You can have three great players. And I feel like I have an awful team. if They're not, you know, at quarterback or wide receiver. And so you, we'll see, man. Um, they got yeah. to get some talent in this draft class. And it'll be interesting to see even what they do in the later rounds. You know, they have three fifth round picks. Do so you use that to trade up to get back into the third or fourth round, mm-hmm. you know, to get mm-hmm. more, um, you know, talent. So um, I got another mock draft coming, another big board. Um, you know, like I said, I got Soria coming on uh, Juju Brents and some other things up the sleeve as well. So I'm excited about I that. Know. I think that uh, the Wednesday night before the draft, I'm going to like enjoy myself because we're going to be locked into the Colts practice facility basically or through the weekend. Not saying we're going to be locked in there for real. But we will be there pretty much all day um, covering the draft and, and bring you all, you know, the news and, and what happened. Um. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, uh, it's gonna be exciting, man. That's I, gonna be so exciting. Oh yeah. Oh my god, I, mean, I can't wait. At the end of the day, man, even how crazy as last year was, and I'm not sure you all feel the same way. It's like you get to these months, you get to the draft, like that 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 urge, that that need, it starts to all over again. It's like, all right, let's do it again. So yep. <laughs> maybe we're crazy for it. Maybe we're crazy for it, but I think that man, that makes it fun. Yeah, it makes it fun. Get that high again. Oh, like, oh mm-hmm. man. It, yeah, it, no, you're right. You're right because training camp, man. Going out there, man. When when out in Westfield, when Matt first time coming on the field, JT, when those guys came up onto the bleachers, started talking, so hype. Everybody's going crazy. You know, you just there was nothing you could say to anybody, and he's like, "Damn, here it is." Six I mean, or nine months later. Hey, it's it's, it's, gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. And again, just for me personally, um, having learned so much that first season, going into year two. 
um it'll be it'll be pretty cool and, and for pretty sure see not only that the, the new guys but also like the older guys um or the older new guys for example like a nick cross you know dallas flowers you know alec pierce like how have they improved lonnie woods i want to see you know drew ogletree you know he was having a great camp last mm -hmm. week i hurt so there's a lot of things to be excited for it's just that again I probably can't write about those things because they pick a quarterback. So they need to hurry up and pick one. So I can give love to the rest of the team because I guarantee you, we talked to Ballard tomorrow, actually, his last uh, pre draft press conference. And I mean, every question is going to be about a quarterback. Yeah. I might slide one in there about like um, a long snapper to make him laugh. There you go. <laughs> we'll see, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be Do awful. it, do it. <laughs> Got to. All right, James. I yeah, we kept you for over an hour. Yeah, it's an hour, man. Appreciate oh, yeah. you. <laughs> that, was, that was an awesome conversation. Really love discussion. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, but you know that that's gonna be it for us, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Colts Cast today. Uh, uh, James Boy, our special guest, came on live on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or any platform you listen to podcasts. And we'll be back next time to give you some more. Take care. I'll take care.